One of the hardest aspects of creating a battle shonen is creating a compelling protagonist character that makes your core audience fall in love with the character's beliefs, mindset, journey, abilities, and etc. Carve out an impactful protagonist character. Audience needs to see this character grow. Audience needs to see this character question their own beliefs, go through trials and tribulations, solidify what their resolve is, and continue to just grow as an overall character. A character like this will resonate in the hearts of your audience. Think of characters outside of Battle Shonen, like Luke Skywalker, Aang from Avatar The Last Airbender. Jump back into Shonen, let's talk about Naruto Uzumaki, Luffy, Goku, Gohan, etc. The characters I just mentioned are legendary characters that everybody has fallen in love with. This wouldn't have been possible if these characters didn't have an opposing force constantly forcing them to grow and creating a great dynamic between good versus evil. One of the most common tropes we see all of storytelling. Well, written antagonist slash villain can give a series more popularity than a well-written protagonist. Over the years, we've seen villainous characters create almost like a cult-like following of people who overly enjoy the character to the point that they go against what the protagonist believes in, which creates a divide or a rift between the fandom, having people rooting for the bad guy. Normally, this doesn't happen. Naturally, people will always root for good to come on top, but when an antagonist is written so well, it's kinda hard not to root for said character. And the rift in the fandom isn't bad. This usually brings about great conversations and debates, making your community for your series fun and increasing its engagement. There's a long list of villains that have been known as the greatest to ever do it, but I'ma list a few. Darth Vader, Lord Voldemort, Madara Uchiha, Aizen, Cell, and Frieza, and the list can go on. The purpose of this video isn't to glaze already glorified antagonist characters. No, the purpose of this video is to talk about an up and coming contender to being one of the greatest antagonists of all times, and his name is Sukuna. After the recent release of season two of Jujutsu Kaisen, Sukuna's name has been ringing bells throughout the anime community of being one of the rawest and most frightening antagonist forces that we've ever seen in Shonen. I personally just think there's been a shortage of great antagonists coming from new gen, series. But before I dive into why Sukuna is a well-written antagonist, we have to explain and go through the core mechanics to what makes a villain a great villain. I've made a short list of things that I think makes a villain great to a series. I spent multiple hours comparing a lot of great antagonists and I came up with this list. So if you agree, the antagonist goes against everything the protagonist cast believes in. Number two, this character should force the protagonist cast to grow. Three, they should have a great introduction. Four, provide a level of a plot twist to the series. Lastly, the character should be a dominant force within the series. Now that you guys have the list, let's see if Sukuna meets these requirements in being a great antagonist. Requirement one, does Sukuna go against everything that the protagonist cast believes in? The answer is yes. Jujutsu Kaisen Society was created to protect the weak from the threats of evil cursed users and cursed spirits that were wreaking havoc all over Japan. This is why the Jujutsu Society created an institution of Jujutsu to sorcerers to protect the weak from these threats. The strong protecting the weak. This is a core theme of the Jujutsu Kaisen series. Ghetto preached the same mindset to Gojo in the hidden inventory arc. And later we saw Ghetto struggle with the same mindset of protecting the weak after watching the death of Rika, leading him to his first villain arc. We saw Yuta unlock the true potential of his full power against Ghetto, sacrificing himself to Rika to unleash her true power to kill Ghetto, all in the name of protecting his weaker friends from the greater threat Ghetto. The same thing we saw with Gojo versus Sukuna. Gojo understood that his students were far weaker than Sukuna, so he decided to fight him first in an attempt to weaken Sukuna. So many of the strongest sorcerers in this series believe in protecting the weak, and that's the reason why they're fighting against Sukuna in the final arc to stop the merger. Sukuna definitely doesn't believe in protecting the weak. He believes in destroying the weak. He believes that they have no purpose in living and that's why he kills and eats them whenever he feels. In chapter 214, 
after Sukuna regained a new vessel. Yuji asks him, why do you spread so much misery? And the answer Sukuna gave Yuji really gave us a solid understanding of Sukuna's mindset. Sukuna states, the real question is, why are you so weak? Why do such weaklings cling so fiercely to life? How can the creature that falls apart at a touch say that it always wants to be happy? The helpless have no choice but to swallow the suffering life gives them. This shows that Sukuna believes the weak shouldn't be allowed to live. They shouldn't be protected. They should endure any suffering that comes their way because they are not strong. Sukuna is a character that goes against the nihilistic beliefs of weak people. And this is something we covered in our video, Sukuna, the Upper Man. So check that out if you ever get bored. There's no need to continue to elaborate on this part because Sukuna is the same character that took a bow after killing thousands of innocent citizens in Japan during the Shibuya arc. Like that anime part when he took the bow was crazy. Greatest to ever do it. Let's move on to the introduction of Sukuna. Even though at the beginning of the series, when Sukuna was first introduced, we learned that he was basically a god from the Heian era the introduction was still very lackluster i personally didn't mind because it kept the mystery surrounding sukuna's character even though the introduction wasn't all of that sukuna made up for everything in the shibuya art i'm telling you peak fiction man let's move on to providing a plot twist some of you guys are probably squinting your face when i said plot twist but if you pay attention in a lot of series a great plot twist from the antagonist really can hold weight in making a series great for example, when it was revealed Darth Vader was actually Luke Skywalker's father. When that mask cracked and we saw it was Obito, Kakashi's long dead friend. When we learned Pain was a student of Jiraiya or where we found out the truth about part of Voldemort being within Harry Potter. Sukuna taking over Megami's body was a plot twist that tied together multiple plot points that the fandom was speculating on for years. Two plot points were Sukuna's interest in Megami and the foreshadow fight between Satoru Gojo and Megami. Early on in the series, when Megami faced off against Sukuna, Sukuna gained an interest in him. In Shibuya, when Megami summoned the general, almost dying in the process, Sukuna came and saved them and said there's something you still need to do for it. The foreshadow fight between Gojo and Megami came out of the Shibuya arc right before Megami made his summoning. We see a flashback scene between Megami and Gojo in chapter 117. This left this fandom speculate when these two were going to fight. It even got so bad that people started to speculate in the culling games that a reincarnated 6 eye user would be summoned by Kenjaku to fight and participate in the culling game. So Sukuna taking over Megami's body and ultimately fighting and killing Gojo fulfilled two major plot points that everyone one was curious about. So to me, that's an amazing plot twist. Let's move on to forcing the characters to grow and develop themselves. Whether it's in life or death, Sukuna always gives characters a million dollars worth of games. He also became an obstacle to force the protagonist cast to grow as characters. Sukuna being the strongest sorcerer to ever exist, history, he's acquired a lot of knowledge that he's willing to pass down while doing battle with his foe. At the end of the fight with Jogo, we see Sukuna giving him a million dollars worth of game. He touched Jogo's soul and the iconic phrase, stand proud, you are strong, came out of this conversation. After Sukuna explained to Jogo how he should have went about attaining his goals, he should have burned everything down to a cinder. Let's move on to Kashimo, a guy that was confused in understanding love from his time period. He was the strongest, but he didn't understand how he can love anybody weaker than him. And Sukuna explained it to him. Sukuna dropped bars saying, we are loved because we are strong. We simply respond to that love in kind. He finishes the conversation saying, let me assure you, love is worthless. The thought of needing someone else to fulfill me never crossed my mind. If I want to eat, I eat. If I see an eyesore, I kill it. And if it entertains me, I throw it a bone. I live according to my own stature. If that can't be measured or understood, that's not my problem. Sukuna's mindset is the same 
same as Sith Lords from the Star Wars series. A random thought, but let's get back on top. What made this conversation the chef kiss in the afterlife, Gojo was having the same issues and the same lack of understanding what true love was and he felt loneliness from being the strongest. And while we're on the top of Gojo, through battle, Sukuna made Gojo grow so much as a sorcerer within that fight. The hoops and hurdles that Gojo had to jump through, if he would have survived, he would have probably became one of the greatest sorcerers of all times, even though he already is. For the modern era, he would eventually reach the heights of Sukuna if he was alive. In the afterlife, Sukuna becomes an evil guru that tells you everything you've done wrong in life. In real time, he conveys his message through battle, through sorcery, where he lives and breathes. We saw him force Higuruma to grow as a sorcerer in their short battle, making him learn reverse curse technique. At the end of this battle with Sukuna, the protagonist cast will have a brand new mindset to continue to live on as sorcerers in the world protecting the weak. That's going to be the major payoff at the end of this fight. We still need to talk about character dynamics when we talk about characters growing because the dynamic of Yuji and Sukuna is so perfect because they're two opposites that lived within the same body, that shared the same soul. And even though Sukuna regards Yuji as a weak sorcerer, because of Yuji's ideals, he's able to stand next to Sukuna and go toe to toe with him. Something that caused Sukuna to have a century life crisis. We saw a glimpse of Sukuna growing right after killing Higuruma. Seeing Yuji use reverse technique sent Sukuna down a spiral where he was thinking about Higuruma and why he felt so unsatisfied after fighting him. Contradicting what he said to Kashimo in the afterlife in chapter 238 saying he doesn't need anyone to satisfy him. Then he looks at Yuji and continues the spiral because he knows Yuji is strong. He knows Yuji is weak, but he's strong because of his ideals. And he saw the same thing in the golden age of Jujutsu, but since he has such an in-depth understanding of Yuji's soul, he knows Yuji has an unbreakable soul. The way Sukuna beats down on these characters then gives them game afterwards reminds me so much of Madara Uchiha. Madara was a menace and such a comedian at the same time. Like bro was funny and he wasn't even trying. Lastly, we're going to finally end this video talking about the antagonist has to be a dominant force within the series. He cannot be a weak or an archetype villain. Darth Vader was one of the greatest lightsaber duelists that ever existed in history. Lord Voldemort was one of the strongest sorcerers and had a huge cult following. Madara was one of the greatest ninjas to ever live. For Sukuna, he's history's strongest sorcerers. I really don't need to go over how much of a dominant force Sukuna is. He's such a menace. Sukuna was regarded as something as a calamity during the golden age of Jujutsu. That's how much of a force he was, a freak of nature. He struck fear in everybody's hearts. You remember the chapter when Sukuna returned in Megami's body and how Oru sensed him and started to have a panic attack. Anybody that stood in Sukuna's presence broke down mentally because of his overbearing strength. Gege made Gojo the roof of the power scaling for the modern day sorcerers. Nobody, none of the sorcerers would be able to surpass Gojo. But Sukuna is leagues above Gojo. So when Gojo faced off, off against Sukuna, of course he lost. And even in that fight, we see a display of Sukuna using his tactical mind to create the world slash, the slash that cut through infinity and killed Gojo. Also saw a great display of his combat abilities against the general in season two of Jujutsu Kaisen, the Shibuya art. Being known as the king of sorcerer, the king of curses, a calamity, history's strongest sorcerer, they don't hand out these titles lightly. They tried to give Gojo this title and you see what happened to him. Now they're making threads every day talking about how he's going to return and differ symbolisms. Sukuna is currently fighting in a weakened state and he still leagues above any of the sorcerers on the protagonist side. That should let you know how powerful he is. He doesn't have a reverse curse technique. He doesn't have his heart. He doesn't have his domain expansion. He's just fighting with the pure will of not losing and the love of sorcery, the love of the game. If Gege can stick this landing, Sukuna is going to go down as one of the greats and nothing anybody can say will ever make me hate Sukuna. Like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you think down in the comments and I'm out.